Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. What's up? Nothing. How you doing? Hi. I'm good. You good? Yeah. We're in summer. We are in summer. I like it. <laughs> There's a little bit of a different feel to summer. Yes. I was thinking about something the other day. I was thinking it might be interesting. It might be a long-winded start, but, you know, you think about, this is going to sound strange, but for some reason in the summer, we sort of behave differently. We have a different mindset and we have different habits in the summer than we do in the winter and the fall that aren't actually completely tied to the weather. They're just sort of a mindset, right? And we have different patterns of behavior based on all kinds of things. And then I was thinking generally about habits, what they are and how you break them and how you even see them as for what they are, which is that they're habitual, for lack of a better word. Yeah. And the patterns, and I was thinking about you and I, you always talk about when something's a pattern, then you can start to think about it as a habit or distinguish between that and a habit. And yeah. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. So the t- as for that's what we're talking about? Habits? We're talking about what are we or talking patterns about? or habits? Well, I think we- I think we have behaviors and then we have patterns and we have habits. And I guess we should sort of suss that out and distinguish between and among them. You know, how do you know the difference? All right. So, yeah. So in systems thinking, um, probably the one of the more popular concepts, so it's best drawn. So I'll draw something. We have a new whiteboard here. So it's it's sometimes called the iceberg idea. And, you know, this is the surface of the ocean. And you might have like a little iceberg. And here's you in, in this ship over here. Right. And you don't want to be the Titanic. So you want to, you, you know, but most folks tend to focus on events that are happening on the surface. So this is like this, this level is kind of the events. You could think of it as the information level, you know, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So for people who aren't looking at this, they need to picture the ocean. Yep. A part of an iceberg peeking out peeking of the ocean, out. and a boat that's kind of coming towards it, but and all the boat it. sees is that top part. Yeah, you yeah. Te- okay. that tends to be what people's sort of action-reaction life is all about, right? Mm-hmm. It's like they tend to, you know, have an action-reaction to this stuff on the surface. And that stuff is like the events that happen in our day, the the information that we're experiencing, the feelings that we're experiencing, that type of stuff, right? And yeah. and we just, it's like act and react. And it's all about kind of doing, you know, it's all doing up here. And it's all in, it, it's into the, th- to the things that are directly in front of us that we can see. That's Pretty what much. we're focused yeah. on is what's yeah. right in front of us and what we, what's in our view. And uh, yeah, that's right. And, and, and the idea is that there's much more to this thing then meets the eye. And so there's 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 a whole you know huge iceberg underneath that's much larger. Mm-hmm. I mean think about an ice cube floating on your drink. Yeah. The part that peeks out is much smaller than the part that's underneath. Right. So what is that part that's underneath made up of? Uh, the the next sort of layer that you might want to think about is what we call patterns. And patterns are just these instantiations, this up here above the water is, you know, instantiations. instantiations. Mm-hmm. You, you might think of that as inst- instances of things, right. events, occurrences. informations, occurrences, instances. Mm-hmm. Well, a pattern is just instances of things that repeat themselves, right? So something happens and then that same thing happens again and that same thing happens again, the same thing happens again. Our ability to recognize patterns is really important. Yeah. So we want to not just see the events or the instantiations, but the repeating patterns, right? Right. And it's not always easy to see. Yeah. I it's not always easy to a, see. A little while ago, you were giving an example in another conversation about, you know, if you end up that you're you're dating the same person over and over again. Right. But you're not seeing it. You're not seeing the pattern of of who you're attracting or who, you know, or how you're. That's a a great example because a lot of folks, if you stay at the event instantiation information level, Mm -hmm. then 
you're not literally dating the same person. You're dating John, and then you're dating Bob, and then you're dating Frank. And mm. John is not Bob is not Frank. Right. So at the instantiation or the event le informational level, the They're part different. above the surface, mm -hmm. you're like, no, those are three different people. Right. But at the pattern level is where you can see, oh, geez, John and Frank and Bob, you know, they all kind of are basically the same dude. You know, they're the same. They, they have the same. The same they way. treat me in the same yeah. way. We have the same dynamic, blah, blah, blah. And that's where you see the pattern, right? Right. And if you can do that, that's great. If you can get below the events, the instantiations, and see the patterns, mm -hmm. right? And a pattern is anytime it's more than two, right? So, mm -hmm. like, the, the example I always give, because it's such a visceral example, is... On 9 11, when the, when the first plane hit, everybody thought, oh, that's terrible. An accident happened where a plane right. ran into a building. When the second plane hit, that's pretty much all anybody needed to know in order to establish a pattern, right? Of, uh, this is something different than an accident. Right. So a pattern is the smallest pattern is two instantiations repeating, mm -hmm. but there could be multiple uh, patterns. Um, but then there's another whole world underneath patterns, which is structure. Structure, the structure of the system, the system structure. And in, in the system sciences, what we talk about is that system structure determines the behavior mm -hmm. of the system. Right. Right. So if you're if you're sort of noticing a pattern where you have this, a similar dynamic with in your dating, let's say. Yeah. That's always a good one for people, <laughs> right? So, oh, I just keep getting in these relationships where it's dysfunctional in this X way, right? Right. Well, something about the system structure that you're setting up is leading to that behavioral pattern. Uh, just because I think this is this is an interesting example, but structure determining behavior. I mean, I think another thing that we've talked about is even um, when you go to the DMV and they've got those those partitions mm -hmm. to make the line. Mm -hmm. So that structure is actually determining the behavior by which Absolutely. the patrons are going through. Yeah, that's so great. analogously, you know, it doesn't have to be a physical thing, right? But that there's something that is causing you to choose a certain way. That's right. For, yeah, and you would yeah. never choose that unless that structure appeared, right? It's, you would never yeah. serpentine through up to no. the front counter unless there was a structure there to determine the behavior. I understand. But that doesn't but you're saying it's not always a physical structure. Well, I mean, technically it's everything's sort of physical oh, at the yeah. end of the day, we'll but do that but time. we'll do that <laughs> <laughs> that's a little bit more deeper, but but I mean it is all it, it might not always be obvious. I mean, that's yes. the biggest problem is that that the events, the information, the instantiations tend to be obvious yes. or at most obvious. You can see them, you can touch them. They're, They're happening in front of you. Yeah. Whereas the patterns are not entirely obvious all the time, which is why we miss them. And the structures are even less obvious, which is why we miss them even more. Right. 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 And there's something that's even more or less obvious than that, which is beneath the structure level. So at the base of the of the iceberg, way yeah. down at the bottom is mental models. Right. And so, you know, these mental models are driving the system structure and the system structure is driving the patterns and the patterns are driving the events. So talk a little bit more about, I think people might be wondering how are mental models causing the system structure? That's a that's kind of a, a, a hard concept to, to think about because you know yeah. we talk a lot about mental models, yep. but we've never related them to you know, yeah, so one way to think of it is is like uh, there's a concept called lock-in uh, in complexity where systems get locked in, right? And so we we've seen this at the at the cusp of the electronic car, the electric car yeah. revolution, right? In the very beginning, when when electric cars first, it was can can we even produce electric cars that are like viable? Right. But then it was like, wow, there's a there's a viable electric car. But what is not viable is the system structure, right. which means I can buy an electric car, but I can't drive across the country. I can't drive from here to D.C. I can't right. drive 400 miles or something like that because there was no system structure. 
right? And and if you think about it, the reason there was no system structure is because everybody believed, every, everybody's mental model for a long time was you needed cars, to, you, you needed gas, right? Gas yeah. cars, yeah. gasoline cars. Right. And so then based on that mental model, obviously every... I see. Uh, you know, every so often you would place, there would be opportunities for gas stations. I get Right? It. But there was no... There was no mental model to, to say, well, we need electric charging stations because we have electric cars. And so for a long time, you could actually get electric cars, but you didn't have really the system structure in place to get charging stations. Right. So the system structure determined that behavior. And, yes. and then people said, OK, well, now we have to work not just on the car part. We got to work on the. Yeah. The network of places that are spaced a certain amount apart, basically on the distance of the, you know, the, yeah. the charging time of the car and things like that. Yeah, I get it. I get what you're saying. And so now we build that system structure. Well, that that comes from a mental model that a collective mental model of, oh, this is this is now possible. You could drive across the United States in an electric vehicle. Yes, I get that. So another way. So I think that's a great example. And I was thinking about uh, a large corporation we worked with where they were shifting from an industrial organization mm -hmm. to a digital industrial organization. That's right. So that's a mental model that's, that's a shift. shifting. Yeah. And that's going to require different structure. Different structure. Absolutely. I understand. That's so they, they could have that mental model first, and then it becomes clear what they need to do. But boy, a lot of work mm -hmm. has to take place to build the structures to move from an industrial mental an industrial set of systems yeah. to a digital industrial set of systems. Interesting. And then those systems are going to create patterns and those patterns are going to create behavior um you know instantiations and events and they, all the things that right. we want to happen up there. So then I have two questions. Yeah. What's the danger of staying up top at the event or the surface cluelessness? <laughs> that was a quick answer. Yeah. Total cluelessness. cluelessness. Yeah, nothing. The, the danger of, of staying up top is that you don't realize that the movement of that top part of the iceberg is almost entirely dependent on the thing underneath, hitting things or being affected by the currents of the ocean underneath. And so you might be paddling and working really hard to, to say, oh, I'm on this little piece of ice. And I'm going to paddle. We're, we're, get, let's all of us paddle real hard to get over there. But the, uh, there's a huge ocean current going the opposite way. That's got this under underwater sail essentially. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, much stronger than you. So the mm -hmm. the aside from cluelessness, it's that you're going to, you know, the things that you want to occur, the effort that you put into those things occurring aren't going to happen the way that you want them to happen. You're not going to get the results that you want. Because there's all this underneath that you're not seeing that's actually shaping what's happening at the surface that you're not aware of. Yeah, or worst case scenario, you're the Titanic. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, that's even worse than just general cluelessness yeah. and not getting results. Total devastation is the worst thing that can happen, which is you go, oh, there's just a little piece of ice. Let's bump it out of the way. <laughs> and uh, well, and then fine. you're the Titanic. <laughs> Everything's fine. We Keep can going. just go for a swim. Yeah. <laughs> That's not good. So then, okay, so that was my first question. My second question is, okay, so so say I understand that, that I am, in, in essence, living at this surface level and I'm just reacting to events. Yes. Right? That's how I'm living my daily life. How do I get, how do I as a person um, learn to go down a level and look for or see the, like, how do you do that? How do you see the patterns? Yeah. So there's, there's one more level here that I would, underneath mental models is this, this, the mental organiza, organizing structure of DSRP. Yes. And if you were to think about your question is how do I kind of penetrate this veil, this surface mm -hmm. and go deeper and deeper down to here, from, from here to here, right? Mm -hmm. And the answer is awareness. Yes. Right? Which in, in science is just called metacognition, right? Right. Which is just being a little bit more aware of how your 
thinking or how you're building these mental models, which is what DSRP gives you. It gives you this awareness. So DSRP is going to help you see the patterns, see the structures, see the mental models, and then possibly distinguish between one mental model and another, mm -hmm. choose a different mental model, and then build structures around that, build patterns around that, build events around that differently. So one word, awareness. I mean, awareness will get you everything. Yes. And we build awareness by intentionally focusing on how we're thinking things through the mental models we're building, slowing ourselves down. Is that where you're heading? Yeah. So that's really interesting because because when people think about awareness, mm -hmm. this is one of my my soapboxy pet PV kind of kind of areas, which is which um, when think people think about awareness they get real like peaceful and meditative and reflective mm -hmm. and they start using words like that. And that's all great. Like meditation is very powerful. Being peaceful is very powerful. Being reflective is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Taking time, going for a hike, you going for a walk, smelling like the daisies. Very generally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> generally. <laughs> but, but what we want to, what we want to understand is that's not the only way to gain awareness. Right. If you practice seeing the way that you're building mental models, you can actually increase the speed and aggressiveness with which you articulate and visualize your mental models. And so you can visualize your mental models while they're happening. You can visualize other people's mental models while they're happening. And it can be a very fast, very active, very purposeful uh task right so it's not always a lot of people think oh you know I, i'm gonna do 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 i'm gonna live in this uh active this this stimulus response world mm -hmm. and then i'm gonna take a break i'm gonna take a vacation i'm gonna go meditate yeah, yeah, right yeah. and and that's one way to handle it but it's really not the operational way of awareness because what you're doing is you're changing the context that you're in well yeah it's it's easy to be calm when you're sitting in a mountain retreat right where it's not easy to be calm is when the bullets are flying and the you know the craziness is happening or the you know at the office the politics and all that that's where you want to have sort of that whole set of events slow down because you're fast at it Yes, I understand that. If that makes sense. Yeah, I guess what I'm getting at is I think a large part of our daily life is al almost autonomic. Like yes. We're going through life just in pattern, 100%. established patterns of what we do, how we think about things, and we're sort of just going through life in a in a in an unaware state. And I, I remember one time I was driving, I was going down to I was used to be in a book club. And um, we had just read the book Flow, which mm -hmm. you sat behind. Yeah. And I was running late, which was a pattern of mine to be late. And then that lateness was causing me to feel stressed. stressed. Anxiety. So then I'm driving, I'm literally driving down the hill to meet the book club, and I'm driving too fast. And I took a moment and I thought, I'm driving too fast. And then I had a moment where I said, I'm driving too fast because I'm running late, because I'm not paying attention to my own, you know, all of these patterns of what happened in the day earlier that caused me to be late. And it was just such a pivotal moment for me. I'm like, you just need to slow down because you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And it was literally, and it was, it was because I, I remember always feeling that way a long time ago, not mm -hmm. recently, driving, like, always being late. And it's just that it, and so when I say slow down, it's not li literally slow down. It's just, it's a, it's a instantaneous moment of pause mm -hmm. where, well, what am I doing? Yes. And why am I doing it? And how is it serving me to be this way? And to me, you have to do that before you get to where you're saying. Well, I think that is what I'm saying. You, that's oh, a perfect example of what I'm saying. Like, it's that's different. What you, I mean, what you just explained is a is a perfect example of what I'm saying because what I think people tend to do 
is they go, 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 right? Mm-hmm. Fire, ready, aim, fire, ready, aim, yeah. fire, ready, aim, fire, ready, aim, staying at the top, above the surface, in the events world, in the stimulus response, mm-hmm. doing, doing, doing world. And then they go, okay, I need to take, I need to take a pause, which is the weekend or a vacation. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the hustle and bustle of the doing world is always separated from the calmness of vacation of the let's say the weekend unless you have kids uh in sports uh you know or or the meditative retreat or the time for but what i'm saying is i see you took a pause right in the middle of it yeah you're saying that pause has to happen every moment yeah not only on the weekend or at a retreat when it's happening when i'm literally barreling down the hill worried for my life because i'm acting irrationally you gotta pause in the crazy yeah. So that you can get you a medical me crazy. No, no, no. In the crazy, <laughs> not in. Well, it could be. You know, in in the craziness of life. Yes. You've got to take a metacognitive pause, yeah. which can be like if you're you get good at it, it can be almost mm-hmm. instantaneous. Mm-hmm. And get good at taking those instantaneous pauses and going, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why yeah. am I saying what I'm saying in this yeah. meeting? Why am I doing what I'm doing? As I'm eating, why am I yeah. working out this way? Why am I, you know, pushing this stretch in this way? Why am I doing what I'm doing when I'm with my yeah. backhand? But whatever it is that's important to you, why am I dressing the way I'm dressing? You know, like whatever is important to you, yeah. having these little metacognitive moments right. interspersed throughout the day, rather than seeing them as like. There's the weekday and there's the weekend. Right, right. Right? Yeah. There's the there's work and there's vacation. Yeah. And I'm saying let's sprinkle in the metacognition into Everywhere. life. Yeah, and I think what's interesting about that, because I remember I, I came back and I and I talked to you about that. And and it was when I sort of started to learn this concept because I had recognized a pattern. And then I think you asked me a question, well, what are the structures in your day that cause you that lead you to be in that spot where mm-hmm. you're running late and you're and you're feeling crazy and you're driving too fast and and that was a, a moment for me where I saw the that connection that you were talking about between the structures and the patterns of behavior that I was exhibiting. Right. So then you have to go back and say, well, what are those structures and yes. what do I need to change? Yes. You know, allowing more time to get ready. You know, not trying to fit too many things in one in one hour. You know, yes. just there were a million little changes to the structure of my day that caused me to not always be late anymore. Yeah. You know, because I anticipated that pattern. And that is that really gets at if you if you sort of take these things here, the patterns, the structures, and the mental models, that is what we call a habit. Stick on that a minute. Well, habits are habits are habitual instantiations of things that are based on system structures, right? Mm-hmm. That are based on mental models. And so if you want to change a habit, you know, there's kind of two ways to deal with habits. There's you're you're trying to build new habits mm-hmm. or you're trying to break existing habits that you that you don't like. So in the case of in the case of your you're rushing all the time in driving. Yeah. You know, there, there's a whole set of mental models and system structures and patterns yes. and events, right, that happen. The events are you're, rush, you're driving yeah. fast, rushing to the next thing. Yeah. But the next thing isn't book club. The next thing is, you know, school drop off for yeah. this meeting or that Everything. meeting or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And the pattern is I'm always doing that. Mm-hmm. I'm doing that thing all over. The structure is... You don't, you know, there could be a lot of structures that you have too many things. You're trying to pack too many things Just into life. You're not managing your time. You're not managing your priorities. Mm-hmm. You're doing a lot of different things. And then the mental model is, okay, I have to do all these things. I need to do all these things. Exactly. I'm a loser if I don't do all these things, <laughs> whatever it is. Mental kids. <laughs> yeah. And... <laughs> And what so that's the that's the sort of uh, maladaptive habit. Yeah. And then what is the adaptive habit? Mm-hmm. That is another set of mental models, driving system structures, driving um, patterns. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'll give you an example. Yeah. Of of this, that's very simple. Yeah. 
I know people have probably learned by now that I, I am neurodiverse. I have, you know, we are, a, ADHD and, and uh, lots of things, autism, things like that. Mm-hmm. It's going to sound crazy, but it's it's actually really difficult for me to make brushing my teeth. Yes. A habit. I am aware. Right. And and so I have to I have to really think about the structures that are in place. Well, I found a structure. Mm hmm which works. And that is that, um, and, and, and it's a, a strange set of structures. Mm-hmm. One is it has to be an electric toothbrush. Okay. Two is it has to be a certain toothpaste that's not too spicy because it, it like yeah. hurts my mouth. <laughs> it hurts my brain through my mouth yeah. is the best way I can explain it. Yeah. And then it has to be in the shower. Right. You the toothbrush con- has to be in the shower and the toothpaste has to be in the shower because I have economy of movement. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm always trying to create economy of movement. Yeah. And so when I do it that way, it works. But if I have it some other way, doesn't it work. doesn't work. Yeah. Because that's right? a structure that's causing your behavior. Yes. And that is what works. So that mental model of how to create those structures and have mm-hmm. those structures in place Versus a different mental model. The mental model most people use is you got a little cup uh, next to your sink and it's got a toothbrush in it and you got your toothpaste there and it's like extra peppermint or whatever. Yeah. And you brush in front of the mirror. Well, that doesn't work for me. No, because because a, a non, uh, an, I guess, neurotypical person who has control over their focus just goes and forces themselves to brush their teeth. That's right. But when you don't have that focus, you have to co-locate it with another necessary function. Yes which allows you to have, and then you're getting a benefit of the economies of your movement, and so you're incentivized. You're like, yes. oh yeah, I can do that. Yes. Um, so that that's a, actually a great example of the structure determining the behavior. And so and I'll give you another example. The You know, I, we had a whole episode on goop. I remember. Well, of course, you know, everybody, I, I don't know very many people that don't like bread, for example. I can, I can resist Skittles and, you yeah. know, sugary things like that that aren't, yeah. terribly attractive yeah but you know probably bread is the harder one oh, because really? bread empirically is delicious right it is but what i had to do was really rebuild the mental model around bread where i said to myself bread every time i see bread i'm going to imagine bread as goop coming out of the in the factory in a tube in a tube <laughs> Like a tube of toothpaste with bread, like huge, a huge spire of bread goop. And and what I did was I retrained my brain to think negatively about bread, mm-hmm. right? And so that's working at the mental model level. Then also not making a rule that there's no bread, also not shopping for bread, all those kinds of structural things you can do. Mm-hmm. And then you change the pattern, which is changing the, you know, the, the almost surface level habit. And you change the instantiation. Yeah. No, that's interesting. So then if I were to say, well, okay, I have this habit. I also came up with the word goop. True. To, to kind of put like a negative, you know, you want to, you want to, you want to take the, if you, if you want to build a habit, what you want to do is make it like really positive, really accessible, really easy, really whatever. And if you want to break a habit, then you want to you want to kind of make it make it like difficult, uh, put things in your way mm-hmm. to stop you from doing it, make it tangibly disgusting, yeah. you know, or something like that. Come up with metaphors that that tap into your emotional centers of disgust. Yeah, you know things yeah. like that. I had a I had a friend who was. Uh, who really loved smoking cigarettes. I love smoking cigarettes. Uh, well, you don't. I don't smoke anyway, cigarettes, but, but, uh, but cigarettes are, are wonderful. No, I don't think so. But To smoke, they're absolutely <laughs> horrible. I hate them. Well, yeah. But, they're horrible for you. Yeah. Obviously, you, we shouldn't smoke. I'm not saying that. But I mean, cigarettes themselves are sublime. I appreciate your perspective. I personally have never enjoyed or or... I grew up in a non-smoking household, so to me, I have a different mental model yeah. of it, probably. But what I was saying was I had a friend who loved smoking. Yeah. 
and really, really had a hard time quitting. And then when, uh, I guess, his wife got pregnant and she said, you have to quit smoking. You got to quit. Yeah. You just, you have to quit smoking. Yeah. And he's just, he didn't believe he could. So he went to this actual therapist who was meant to, to break habits. That was all he did was help mm -hmm. people break bad habits. And the first thing he said, I was, t I remember talking to him after he went to a session was, take a piece of paper and add up how much you spend on cigarettes yeah. in a day. Okay. Multiply it by week, by month, by year. And then make a list of all the things you wish you had today that you could have bought with all that money. Mm -hmm. So that's a negative, that's what you're saying. It's a really negative association, it's an opportunity cost. And it's also working at this mental, mental. model level, yeah. right? So that you can then change the structures, right? Mm -hmm. So a habit is a pretty stubborn thing by definition. Right. And it has all these layers to it. It's got event instantiation. It's got pattern. It's got system structure. It's got mental model structure. So that's why they're difficult to undo. Mm -hmm. So you got to hit it from a lot of different places. It's a web of causality. It's not a single cause. Right. So, it, you know, yes, he's got to add up all the cost of smoking, mm -hmm. but that's not going to break that habit. He's yeah. got to do 20 other things in his life to make it more difficult to smoke at that key moment mm -hmm. when it's almost impossible not to smoke. Right. Right? Like it feels absolutely essential Essential yeah. that I go smoke. You're going to die. And at that moment, you've got to create a bunch of difficulty. Right. Right? Including and structures. Including structures to create difficulty, yeah. to get in your way. Right? Yeah. And the more you do that, the more you're going to be able to overcome that really difficult moment. Mm -hmm that is emotional and visceral and all these kinds of things. And the same goes for trying to build a new habit. For a new habit, you got to remove all those barriers, right? right? And make it really easy to make that healthy choice or make it easy to... But in order to do any of that, you've got to understand these levels of the instantiation level, the pattern level, the system structure... And then most importantly, the mental models and how you're organizing them and how you can organize them differently, how you can DSRP your mental models in a different way. Because a lot of times the reason that a habit is a habit is because you can't imagine mm -hmm. doing it differently. Right. You can't imagine a, a mental model being organized differently. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine it being organized differently, then... You can commit to that. You can make that attractive. You right. can make this mental model, this old mental model that's spurring the current habit, yeah. unattractive. unattractive. Yeah. You can build the structures, put the structures in place that make this one easy and this one difficult. Yeah. Right. You can pay attention to the patterns of where you're going to go off the rails mm -hmm. over here and block and where you're getting on the rails and reward. You know, yeah. those kinds of things. So when you when you originally were talking about this and you were talking about that, that this path is the path of awareness, it's metacognition. And when you when you take this these ideas relative to habit, what you're saying is if you think you have a habit that's let's say in this case bad for you, you have to be aware of the behaviors that you engage in, why you behave in them, what structures are facilitating you to have that bad habit. Mm -hmm. Rework the structures, you'll get different behavior. Yep. That's why people remove cigarettes from their house. They remove bread from their fridge. They, yeah, I mean, you, right? you have to see the pattern first, Yeah. right? And then see the system structures. And, and I know that sounds like maybe a little strange, like you have to see the pattern. How could you not see the pattern? But a lot of people don't see the pattern. It's, easy not, You'd be, the it's easy not to see the pattern. Like, because if I drink, I'm not an alcoholic. But if I drink and drink and drink and, it, and it's consistently causing problems and I'm not picking up my kids and I'm not doing this and I'm, yeah. you know, then all of a sudden at some point that becomes a pattern. Yeah. Right. So the instantiation alone isn't enough. But if you never recognize the pattern, just like in AA, like one of the first the Alcoholics Anonymous, like, you know, the, the first thing they, they need you to do is say, hey, I'm I'm an alcoholic. Well, that's yeah. calling out the pattern. They're not saying, right. 
I drink alcohol right. or I drank alcohol. They're saying I am an alcoholic. Which that means, means I'm drinking it. I am in a pattern. Yeah. That's why it's so critical because it means you're below the surface. You're below the event instantiation. Yeah. And that's the critical moment where you can start some healing. Or some change, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, this this isn't just for habits. I'm just putting no, it in that I know. context. Yeah, yeah. Then once you see the pattern, then you can start to say, okay, what system structures nearly ensure that this pattern's not going to change? Yeah. Right. Let's talk a little bit. We've talked a lot about it, the pattern and structure, a little bit at mental models. Let's talk a little bit more at this deeper level. So let's say, for example. Um, you recognize that you have a, let's just stick with you. I have a pattern in which I'm literally drinking every day mm -hmm. and I finally realize it. And then I realize the one of the ways I can stop having that pattern is I, you know, I change the structure of my day. I remove the alcohol from my house. There's just different things I do to try to get myself not to, mm -hmm. not to drink. Well, maybe my mental model is, well, I need alcohol to manage my stress. Mm -hmm. Which means then I have to replace that mental motto with maybe I need to start running to manage my stress. Yes. Right? So it's just that mental model shift. But at the very basal level, because in the beginning you talked about DSRP being that elemental thing. Well, that's a distinction, right? That's a mm -hmm. distinction of what I need and what I want. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm wondering is we should talk a little bit about how these two things relate to the whole thing. Right. Why is DSRP at the base of awareness? Yeah, because mental models, mental models, we say M equals IO. Mental models are made up of information and the way that information is organized. Mm -hmm. And DSRP is are the th ways that all humans organize information. Right. So again, the information is up here at the top, but how we organize that ment that information determines what our mental model is. And so, you know, we're going to make certain distinctions like you you know, you you mentioned that there's drinking and then there's stress and then there's the relationship right between the drinking and the stress. So the stress leads to the drinking or something like that, right? right? Or the stress leads to the mm -hmm. smoking or whatever whatever it is, right? Okay, well, you know, so this this is really a, a, an effect of some other thing, right? And there's a relationship there. Well, you know, what what is leading to the stress, for example, right? So we need to think about the relationships and and the the parts of the whole mm -hmm. that lead to the stress. And is there something we could change about the way that's organized? Yes. And can and like you said, can we can we have stress? Uh, lead to a different behavior, like working out instead of smoking or drinking. So right. can we get rid of smoking, get rid of drinking, and do some working out or mm -hmm. go for a run? Oh, okay, those are different ways to deal with stress. But just replacing this for that, you know, that's one solution. Just replacing running, you know, drinking with running, that's a solution. Yeah, I mean it's a reactive solution. But it, yes, yeah. it's it's somewhat reactionary yes, and it'll absolutely. it'll have a possibly positive effect. But is there something we can do on this side with this these set of parts and these causes that are leading to the stress in the first place? Because this is the problem. This is the problem. Th these are outcomes of this. Yes, and this is a mental right. model. So this and a, yeah, sorry, I'm pointing at the stress. The stress, so the stress is the problem. The yeah. drinking and the smoking are an outcome yes. or a reaction to the stress. So what, what you are saying is that it would be, re yes, it'd be better to work out or run, but you still have the causal thing of the stress. Exactly. So go back behind the stress, right? What are these three things that cause the stress and work on these? And is there anything, you know, wh why is it that, I mean, in the same way that you might be addicted to smoking or drinking, or exercise or whatever, are you addicted to stress? Oh, see, that's weird, but yes. Right? Are, I mean, you know, like, as a, again, as a neurodiverse person, I use stress all the time because we have trouble with transitions, mm -hmm. right? So for me, inside of an activity isn't difficult, but for a, a transitions can be deadly. Like, literally, just like yeah. moving from this project to this project 
Yes. The switching costs for a neurodiverse person are immense. They're yeah. difficult. They're and that's, very difficult. And sometimes you have to use things purposefully to get you over that transitionary hump. So another way to think about that is you use stress as a means to create your focus to shift. Yes. Right? And so there's this running joke in our household. That's why we get at the <laughs> airport every morning, every time at 2 in the morning, no matter what time <laughs> Before our Before the is, pilots. We're literally at the airport because that's that that cost for you is high. And yes. then the thing that's interesting, though, is once you've switched your focus, then you're hyper-focused. Yes. Right? So the transition is the hard part. But then... Then it's, I got to get to the airport, I got to get to the airport, yeah. I got to get to the airport. Yeah. And then we're all sitting there before the coffee's been <laughs> brewed. <laughs> before the stores are open. <laughs> Waiting yeah. way ahead of the flight. Yeah, exactly. But it's part of our charm now. I mean, it's part of our fun. We yes. look forward to it yes. and we joke about it, which is good. Well, I was just thinking that, that one thing the research says on, on this is that, that increasing awareness mm -hmm will increase your success in all domains. It's really, yeah, that's right. It's really quite remarkable that something as simple as metacognition, simple awareness, like just expanding your awareness of what you're doing in the moment. And I really mean that, like in the moment, expanding your, your awareness of what you're doing and why you're doing it in the moment, rather than taking a meditation retreat. I'm not yes. against meditation retreats. Yeah. I'm not against going for a walk, you know, yoga, whatever. Yeah. Right. B vacations. But those are those are different. Like that's to decompress and, to, you know, gain perspective and all this kind of stuff. What I'm talking about is awareness in the moment. Awareness, like I think of it as ready, aim, fire instead of fire, ready, aim. Right. It's ready aim fire the ready is a moment yeah and it can be very fast but you don't go fire ready aim you go ready aim fire i would also say i think doing that in the moment i mean my memory of barreling down that hill in my car mm -hmm. was probably 15 years ago mm -hmm. and because i had that moment in the moment i i will never forget it i mean it's That's literally right. something i have and and literally when I'm going somewhere and I'm starting to feel that way, I'm like, uh, and I can remind myself, remember that? Yep. 15 years ago, you don't want to be that. Yep. You don't want to go back there. That was a bad pattern. That's right. Yeah, and it was not good for me. So I think that's And that's right. where a lot of our life happens is in the moment. Yeah. You know, so so always waiting for some, some relaxing, you know, reflective moment in order to be calm and peaceful and all these things. That's not that's not very pragmatic for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. What's pragmatic is awareness in the moment. And 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 what our research has really shown is that you can you can build with a with not very much effort, you can build the ability, the skill to have greater awareness in every moment yeah. without that much effort. Yeah. And it will have a dramatic impact on you. Uh, it'll trans it really transforms the way you live your life. Yeah. Um, and it transforms your relationship to yourself because yes. you actually kind of become your buddy, yeah. your own best buddy. And then you're never, you, then you're never lonely because you, know, you have your own best buddy with you all the time. That's true. And you know, what's funny is ever since that time where I sort of saw myself barreling down that hill in the car and I sort of. At that moment, that, that awareness came at me stepping outside of it for a second and looking down. Mm -hmm. Now when I'm doing things that I find, like, I don't know, random things, I'm kind of looking at myself from up above. And I'm like, what is what is she doing? Yeah. Like, should she be doing that? Is that a pattern? Is that a good, you know, like, where's that headed? And and so this this sort of, I know you always this third eye thing, which is a little alien. Like You got to Jane good all that shit. You got to observe yourself. Yeah. Become a student of yourself. Yeah. Pay attention to your patterns. Think Pay about yourself as like yeah. a, a very interesting primate. primate. Yeah. And well, and are. then another part of yourself is Jane Goodall hanging out in the bushes watching you and being like, huh, what's that? What's that guy doing what's over there? Doing? What's that little monkey doing <laughs> over there? What's he up to? But he's you, you know, or she's you or yeah. whatever. And just putting a little part of your brain on you. Yeah. 
to be and being curious. I mean, yeah. really being curious, not judgmental, because a lot of our the part of our brain that's on us is very judgy. Yeah. You don't want to be the judgy. Jane Goodall wasn't sitting there judging primates from Just the bushes. Observing. She was like fascinated. She's, with brilliant, she's like brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's brilliant. amazing. One of the best scientists. And she she's like fascinated by these by these monkeys, by these primates, right? And and so like you're the primate and you're Jane Goodall in your own life. Yeah. And be fascinated by yourself because you're an interesting critter. Yeah. You know, we're all interesting critters and we do yeah. interesting things and for interesting reasons. And we we very rarely it is extremely rare that we do things for no reason. That's interesting. That's we're a never podcast. <laughs> we're never doing some anything for no reason. There's, There's always, always a logic it. Yeah. to it. Yeah. It, it might not always seem that way, but there's always some underlying Thing. logic to why we're doing what we're doing because we're trying to we're trying to realize something or get something or or bring something about or you know our mental model of the situation might be wrong and so then in in you in, know in hindsight it looks illogical and yeah. silly yeah but like at the that. time it makes entire sense, total sense. To us. To us. While we're doing yes, it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So if you kind of take that step back, you might actually see it differently. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So is th was that what you wanted to talk about? That. Or was that a completely in a totally different direction than what you were talking about? No, that was uh, exactly what I wanted to talk about and much, much more. Oh. And so I, per I personally find this conversation fascinating. I'm hoping that everybody else did too which means it's time for us to wrap. Mm -hmm.